Hello and welcome everybody to today's nano safety cluster webinar on immune responses from occupational exposure to carbon nanotubes and nanofibers. We are expecting three experts, um, Matthew Dahm, Aaron Erdely, and Mary Kay schubauer Berrigan, who are from the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention in the US. Um, the NIOS. So a few words on the presenters. Um, Matthew Dahm uh, works as currently as a research industrial hygienist at the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health in Cincinnati, Ohio. He has 10 years of experience in conducting exposure assessment studies in carbon nanotubes and nanofiber workplaces. Matthew has focused his research efforts in developing sampling and exposure assessment methods for carbon nanotubes and nanofibers and was the lead exposure assessor and co-investigator for a recently conducted epidemiologic study by on workers exposed to these materials within the US. And you see here on the slide uh, left bottom corner, the citation of the study uh, where they are going to referring to today in their uh, talks. Aaron Erdely uh, currently works as, the as a research biologist also at the NIOSH, however, uh, in a different place in Morgantown, West Virginia. Uh, he has 15 years of experience in local and systemic toxicity, following pulmonary exposure and more than 20 years experience in designing in vivo studies. Studies include metal-rich particulate matter and engineered nanomaterial exposures to elucidate mechanisms of uh, systemic dysfunction and pulmonary inflammation and injury. We also have today here Mary K. Schubauer Berrigan, who has been working a long time, 20 years, also at the NIOSH in Cincinnati, Ohio. But since two years, she has been uh, assigned to working as a senior epidemiologist, acting as the head of the monographs program of the International Agency for Research on Cancer in Lyon, France. Um, and in Ohio, she has led the epidemiological studies on health effects of uh, in workers exposed to carbon nanotubes and nanofibers, ionizing radiation, beryllium, and so on. So we're very, very happy to have these three experts here today. They are going to have um, a shared talk. Uh, we are going to transfer the slides uh, in a couple of minutes to them uh, to listen to their talk. Please, um, all of you, micro uh, mute your microphone. Um, and whenever you have uh, a question in mind, please be so kind, put it into the chat window. We and I am as a moderator going to come to these uh, questions and we can discuss after the three talks um, in a QA session, um, go through the questions and discuss uh, the item. A few words on, uh, on myself. This is myself on the left uh, side here, Martin Himmler. I'm from the University of Salzburg, Austria. I'm uh, the chair of the Nano Safety Cluster Work Group A, which is um, dealing with communication, training, and education uh, of the Nano Safety Cluster. Uh, you also see here Stella, my co chair of the Work Group A. We are concerned with uh, cross linking activities, training activities, communication activities of the different projects that are currently running on nano safety issues and being um, overarched by the Nano Safety Cluster. So training, uh, communication, going even beyond uh, nano safety by itself. So also touching the fields of microplastics research or so these environmental aspects there, advanced innovative materials for future nanomedicines, things like that. So we are going to uh, to offer more webinars and training programs. We do this uh, uh, jointly organized together with the. Uh, deep dissemination group uh, of the nano safety cluster you see here in the top right corner uh, the email address and we are very um, uh, encouraging to you if you like and you're interested in these topics and in this what's going on further uh, to go there to this uh, web page and sign uh, to up the mailing list of uh, the work group a or you find also other work groups there that are on specific topics um, and then you get more information and can involve can be involved in the future uh, in uh, training uh, activities or in other task forces that are built there. Finally, once again, a few housekeeping uh, mentions. Once again, please mute microphones that we don't have any uh, unwanted disturbances. 
Um, put your questions uh, at any time into the chat window. I will come back to that and uh, come pick them up uh, for the QA session, which, which is going to be at the end after the free talks. Everything is going to be recorded and our recording is going to be shared via the NIA YouTube channel. So you will be getting uh, the links for that, the links also for the slides and uh, also citations that were mentioned are going to be mentioned during the talks. With that, um, I wish you um, have a nice, um, joyful webinar. And I uh, transfer the moderation role, please, then to Mary to continue with. Good. OK, we're ready to start as soon as Aaron would like to kick us off. All right, I'm ready to go. Thank you, Martin, for the introduction. And on behalf of Mary, Matt, and myself, We'd like to thank the Nano Safety Cluster for the invitation to present our work. And thank you to everyone who joined online across many different time zones. As Martin indicated, today we will be presenting our recent findings of assessing the immune response in uh, workers handling carbon nanotubes and nanofibers. Next slide, please. Most people in this area of research are familiar with the potential toxicities of carbon nanotube and nanofiber exposure, so I don't really feel the need to expand on that. As the results of the initial in vivo and in vitro toxicity studies began being published about 15 years or so ago now, uh, concerns for those handling the materials needed addressed. In 2010, a meeting was held to plan these epidemiologic studies as the pulmonary effects were coming to light, as well as systemic effects, such as cardiovascular and immune effects. And, and these results raise concern. Next slide, please. In this presentation, we will be focusing on potential immune effects. Uh, Jake McDonald's group at Loveless and Scott Birchall's group next door at the University of New Mexico published work on how inhaled multiwall carbon nanotubes suppress the immune system. Interestingly, these effects were essentially with no pulmonary inflammation. Those results were consistent with the growing body of literature, the cardiovascular research of particulate matter and engineered nanomaterial exposure, in that greater sensitivity can be observed in the periphery following an inhalation exposure, absent of overt pulmonary responses. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the question then was, how can we test this immune response in the field? As you can do in in vivo studies, collecting the spleen was not really an option. So as Matt and Mary will present later on, we were not expecting high exposure levels or a workforce handling the materials long enough to, to, to have developed chronic disease. At the time of constructing the study, my lab was working with this true culture system from Myriad Rules-Based Medicine. For those who are not familiar, it's an ex vivo system where you can challenge collected whole blood to model in vivo immune responses. We felt this secondary stimulation may help unmask underlying subclinical effects given the expected low occupational exposures. The advantage of this method, are, there are several of them. It, it allows for customized stimulants so you can decide what you wanna challenge. There's limited sample manipulation, so you're not doing the work of isolating PBMCs, and that allows you to do this in the field. The whole blood also allows the retention of all the circulating factors to play a role in this stimulation process, so platelets, circulating hormones, et cetera. And importantly, each study participant serves as their own control because we'll have a null tube with no stimulants, and then we can have a stimulant tube for each individual. So it kind of will help reduce the noise of a cross-sectional study. Next slide, please. So how did 
we arrive that this may actually work. Well, occupational exposures are known to alter immune responses. One thing that we worked with at NIOSH was welding fumes. Of particular interest was Stacy Anderson's work that showed welding fume exposure caused very similar outcomes of systemic adaptive immune suppression as the studies from New Mexico with multi-wall carbon nanotubes. In conjunction, we were using the true culture system and we found that the circulating leukocyte population was unable to adequately respond to a secondary challenge. And this is the graph shown on the right. We used LPS, which is more of a TLR4 innate, innate immune response challenge. And we found when we challenged the circulating leukocytes, they weren't able to produce inflammatory proteins following exposure as a sham group would. The results told us that the assay design worked for a pulmonary exposure, and that the circulating cells are compromised following a pulmonary exposure. And this is kind of interesting, meaning that if these cells are brought into the lung to mitigate a pulmonary exposure, they may actually have reduced effectiveness before they even get to the lung. Next slide, please. I wanted to, I wanted to include one slide that used the word mechanism, but you know, these, we're trying to understand the mechanisms for the adaptive immune study uh, out of New Mexico. They, they showed some COX-2 upregulation in the spleen. For our studies looking with the true culture system, we, we looked more at oxidative stress as a potential factor. And we came to this because in the previous slide, I showed you reduced protein production. But when we harvested the cells from this true culture system and looked transcriptionally, the cells were fine, meaning that these effects had to happen post-transcriptional. Oxidative stress can, can interfere with translation, and both qualitatively by confocal and quantitatively by flow cytometry on the right-hand side, the circulating leukocytes had, had increased levels of oxidative stress. If you bring that concept into the current literature for engineered nanomaterial research, looking at results from Il-Ju's group in Korea that looked at a multi-wall carbon nanotube facility, Dr. Lau's group in Taiwan that looked at a series of engineered nanomaterials, uh, the recent work from our group, as well as others, including Dr. Paklova's work with the titanium dioxide workers, it all illustrated alterations in biomarkers of oxidative stress, further supporting the use of this true culture asset. Next slide, please. So taken together, we anticipated the true culture assay to be sensitive in either a rodent model or a human study following a pulmonary exposure. And also extrapolating actual workplace exposures to outcomes from numerous laboratories at the time, that's what's shown on the right, and knowing the average worker handling these materials was less than 10 years, we felt we needed to add additional sensitive measurements beyond traditional clinical outcomes and the anticipation was that this true culture assay would be more informative than a single snapshot plasma cytokine panel in a cross-sectional study design. And with that brief overview, I will turn the microphone over to Mary Ann Matt. Thank you so much, Aaron. And now that Aaron has given you the motivation for wanting to do the research, I and then Matt will lay out the design of the study initially and then talk to you a little bit about the results. So this is all done in the setting of collaborative research studies at, at NIOSH that began with exposure assessment, which Matt will be describing in much more detail momentarily. But we wanted to have a suite of different exposure measurements because coming into the study, we really had no good idea which measurements might be if any, most closely correlated with any health outcomes that could be observed. So as you see here, we selected a suite of possible exposure measurements and incorporated them into the design of the study. 
we also had interest in assessing toxicology. So in addition to the studies that Aaron has mentioned thus far related to welding fume exposure, we also had studies that look at, or that are ongoing even, that are looking at in vivo exposures and in vitro screening in animal models. But what I'm going to focus on as my part of the talk are the human studies, the epidemiology. And this also had several components. First, there, there is a cross-sectional study in which uh, we are looking for information on the most biologically relevant dose or exposure metric, as I mentioned, and then tying that to clinical functional measures like lung function, heart function measures, and complete blood count. So these would be endpoints that have some sort of clinical meaning. In addition, we designed a component that looks at circulating biomarkers of inflammation, of oxidative stress, and of endothelial cell responses, which interestingly have received a lot of attention in the current COVID-19 uh, crisis that we face. But what we'll be talking about today are the biomarkers of functional immune response, which Aaron has nicely framed for you um, as, as the true culture assay. What we won't talk about now is the ongoing work at NIOSH to develop an exposure registry and to design a potential prospective cohort study. So as specific background, we were interested in direct evidence, if any, of adverse effects within the occupationally exposed population. This is limited because of the small workforce size globally, and as Aaron has already mentioned, the short latency between exposure and any potential chronic disease that might be found. So we designed an, what we call an industry-wide study, which is uh, a huge part of what NIOSH does, is it studies workers from all over the United States. And indeed, that design was necessary because uh, workforces, at least in the US, tend to be very small, and they do a wide variety of activities. So we visited more than 12 sites in order to identify 102 workers who were handling carbon nanotubes or carbon nanofibers, here abbreviated CNTF. And in this study, we've previously found that there were few circulating biomarkers of early effect that were associated with CNTF exposure. I'll touch on that in a minute to, or at, at the end of the talk to illustrate the difference between the functional immune assay results and the circulating biomarkers. So the aim of this component of the study was to evaluate the association between CNTF exposure metrics and ex vivo responses of whole blood challenged with secondary stimulants in a cross-sectional study of 102 US workers handling carbon nanotubes or carbon nanofibers, uh, very typical examples of which are shown in the images at right. And with that, I will turn it over to Matt. Thank you, Mary. Um, so over the next few slides, I'll, I'll discuss some of the industrial hygiene methods that we use to assess exposures for each participant um, and kind of tease out some of those uh, immune response effects that were used in dust response analysis. So as personal breathing zone samples, we collected uh, multi-day exposures using transmission electron microscopy and elemental carbon air concentrations among the 102 U.S. workers that Mary mentioned. Um, there were actually 108 participants in the exposure assessment study, so, so the results that I'll be discussing focus on 108 participants, uh, but only 102 participants provided whole blood and were analyzed for the true culture analysis and the biomarker analysis that Mary will be discussing. So we also measured area-based non-specific nanoscale particle concentration and mass, so that was particle number concentration and mass. Um, and these were used um, doing a, a suite of direct reading instruments. And the reason for this, um, were, the reason that we collected these area samples was to understand the uh, ambient uh, ultrafine particle concentrations within these workforces that differentiated mostly at times uh, with the actual uh, carbon nanotube and nanofiber exposure. Um, and was also used as a confounder in our analysis. We also obtained uh, demographic, lifestyle, lifestyle, medical, and other occupational information via in-person interview for each participant. Next slide, please. So um, we actually ended up visiting 12 site visits uh, that were conducted between 2012 and 2014. Um, these sites can visit, consisted of primary manufacturers. So these were companies that are actually producing carbon nanotubes and nanofibers. 
uh, as well as secondary manufacturers. So these were downstream users and uh, or users of these materials. And these were predominantly in the composites and electronics industries, as well as what we termed hybrid producers and users. So these were companies that were not only producing the material, but incorporated into a product all on the same site. Um, so from those 108 individual participants that I, I previously mentioned, uh, we assessed exposure over two full work shifts as eight hour time weighted average uh, samples. Um, for each personal sample, we collected three total samples. So two samples were collected for elemental mass and one sample was for a quantitative TEM analysis. And the reason why we wanted to collect at least two samples for each participant um, is because most of these facilities were operating more of what I would refer to as a research and development scale. Um, so they, they weren't necessarily in industrial manufacturing at this point. Um, so their tasks greatly varied from day to day. So we wanted to try to minimize that variability the best that we could. Um, so what we actually did was by collecting multiple samples for each individual, um, we just averaged those samples and that averaged uh, sample concentration was used in the dose response analysis. Uh, next slide, please. So specifically for the air sampling methods, as I mentioned, uh, elemental carbon was used uh, for a mass-based measurement. Um, and this was analyzed using NIOSH method 5040, which was originally designed for diesel exhaust. Uh, we collected two samples for elemental carbon. One was collected at the respirable size fraction, um, which is predominantly in a deposit in the alveolar region. And then one sample was collected at the inhalable fraction, which is going to deposit more likely up in the upper airways. Uh, a transmission electron microscopy sample was also collected um, with each personal breathing zone set of samples. Uh, the, the analysis method was NIOSH method 7402, which is originally designed for uh, asbestos. So each sample was collected at the inhalable size fraction. Uh, and instead of, you know, obviously it, the method was designed for asbestos, we had to kind of alter it uh, slightly um, to make it more specific for carbon nanotubes and nanofibers. Um, so what we refer to these are as carbon nanotubes and nanofiber structures. Uh, so a structure could consist of a single fiber, um, as you see in that image below, or typically what we would find are these structures would be more agglomerated materials and they could consist of, you know, a few individual fibers or they could consist of maybe thousands of individual fibers. So to try to uh, differentiate between, you know, single fibers or small agglomerates compared to larger agglomerates, we decided to develop six different size bins um, that we that we place these agglomerated materials or single fibers into based upon their two-dimensional and crosswise dimension. Um, so these bins consisted of single fiber bin, um, a bin for agglomerates less than one micron, agglomerates between one and two microns, two and five microns, five and 10, and then greater than 10 microns. Next slide, please. So I, I just wanted to kind of go over some of the exposure metrics, um, you know, as there's still a, a lot of conversation on what's the most, most appropriate exposure metric um, for, you know, assessing exposures to nanomaterials. So I, I think the one that is most commonly talked about is surface area. Uh, and, and, and the reason behind this is I, I think most early toxicology studies showed a good correlation between toxicity and increasing surface area. Um, which makes it a you know a, a potentially reliable um, exposure metric for toxicity studies, uh, but when we actually translate that into the industrial atmosphere, um, it's very difficult to actually provide uh, specific and reliable surface area measurements. The the tools that we have um, do not provide specific measurements. Uh, they they ultimately provide um, a snapshot of the entire ambient atmosphere rather than necessarily the the nanomaterial of interest. So we opted to not use uh, any surface area measurements for our uh, exposure assessment. Um, as far as mass goes, um, you know, gravimetric analysis is really the bread and butter of industrial hygiene over the last 90 to 100 years. And that's essentially, you know, you have a pre-weighed filter, you collect an air sample, and then you do a post mass measurement um, on that filter. And you, you, know, you, you assume whatever is collected on that filter is the material of interest. So obviously the issues with that for nanomaterials is, especially for carbon nanotubes and nanofibers, is that they're not very dense. They don't have a lot of mass behind them. 
Um, and in, in specific instances, in, 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 exclusively in the composites industries where they're using lots of different resins, um, the mass of you know, ambient particles could really mask um, any nanomaterial that you could be interested in using. So gravimetric mass is, isn't necessarily appropriate for nanomaterials. Um, and that is the reason why we instead chose a chemical specific mass in, in the form of elemental carbon. And even that isn't necessarily 100% specific specific um, because there is ultra or there is ambient elemental carbon um, within the atmosphere and this typically is in, in the form of um, air pollution so we did the best that we could to try to uh, background correct for these measurements and i can talk about that here in the next couple slides um, and then the, another common uh, metric that we, we discuss is particle number and size. So we opted to go with the offline option using electron microscopy, which is obviously very tedious and expensive, um, but it does provide very good specificity and sensitivity. Uh, the other line, the other option is to use online uh, measurements in the form of direct reading instruments. Um, so these are, you know, fantastic instruments that can provide instantaneous measurements of both particle number and size. Um, there's a whole you know, world of different instruments out there that you can use, uh, but all, ultimately the, the biggest problem with those are that they're not going to provide that specificity. They're going to measure everything that's in the, you know, the workplace atmosphere um, and not necessarily inform you of the nanomaterial of interest that you're, you're particularly looking for. Um, so we opted to, again to go with the electron microscopy analysis. Um, and just as a little background. In the middle of our study, um, NIOSH put out a current intelligence bulletin which provided a recommended exposure limit for carbon nanotubes and nanofibers uh, set at one microgram per cubic meter at the respirable aerosol, aerosol size fraction. Next slide, please. So additionally, uh, we collected samples for dermal analysis, and this was done uh, through a tape stripping method, which essentially we just put a piece of, piece of scotch tape, um, applied it to their hand, specifically their palm and fingertips, as well as their wrist. And this was analyzed through scanning an electron microscope and simply provided us a qualitative yes or no, either carbon nanotubes were present or they were not present on the sample. Um, same goes for the sputum analysis. So induced sputum was actually, um, collected for the originally for the biomarker analysis, uh, but we felt since we had the sample, um, we, we should take full advantage of it. Um, so we performed an enhanced dark field microscopy analysis on it. Um, again, to simply identify qualitatively, yes or no, were there any carbon nanotubes present in the sputum or not? And this was indicative of, you know, a person potentially ingesting or inhaling a carbon nanotube and, and theoretically reaching the, the deeper parts of the lung in the alveolar region. Next slide, please. So as far as air sampling results go, um, for the elemental carbon mass at the respirable size fraction, 7% uh, of the samples that we collected were above the NIOSH REL, so that was above one microgram per cubic meter. Uh, the arithmetic mean for that, for those sets of samples was one microgram per cubic meter, and the geometric mean was 0 0.08 micrograms per cubic meter. Um, so on the right, you, you, you see a right skewed data set, and this is very typical for industrial hygiene samples. Um, and, and the difference between the arithmetic mean and the geometric mean is, is, is simply that there was a few samples or a few individuals that had very high exposures, and that's what drove that arithmetic, ar arithmetic mean much higher. Um, same goes for the inhalable set of samples that we collected. Um, since there is no occupational exposure limit yet for the inhalable size fraction, I'll, I'll, I'll compare it for comparative purposes only to one microgram per cubic meter, which is the NIOSH, current NIOSH route, the respirable size fraction. Uh, but 29% of those samples were above one microgram per cubic meter. So you can see there was quite a few more samples that, that were above one. Uh, the arithmetic mean was 6.22 and the geometric mean was 0.14. So again, there was a very few uh, samples that really drove that arithmetic mean much higher. Uh, for the transmissional electron microscopy analysis, 21% um, of the samples were above the OSHA asbestos pell of 0.1 fibers per cubic centimeter uh, with an arithmetic mean of 0.128 and a geometric mean of 0 0.008. Next slide, please. So one, one thing that I wanted to get the point across to, from the 12 facilities that we visited, um, I believe 10 of them predominantly used multi-wall carbon nanotubes as the, the carbon nanotube of choice. Um, and there was a difference in exposures between multi-wall and car or single-wall carbon nanotubes. So multi-walls 
predominantly used in the composites industries in much higher quantities. So we actually saw uh, slightly higher exposures with resveratrol coming in at 0.68 microns per cubic meter and inhaled at 4.5, compared to the single wall, which only had a resveratrol exposure of 0.16 and then inhalable at 0.27 microns per cubic meter. So for the dermal samples, we found that 70% had a positive um, sample on the wrist and 63% had a positive sample on their hand. And for sputum, 18% found positive samples. Next slide, please. And this is just to give you an idea of the, um, you know, what, what size we were typically seeing as far as the agglomerate and the single fibers goes. So on the x-axis, you can see the six size bins that we choose or that we chose for our transmission electron microscopy analysis. And then the y-axis is actually the percent of total number of the structures that we counted for all of the 200 samples that we collected from all participants. Um, so you can see predominantly about 80% of the samples were actually greater than two microns. So this is this is telling us that you know, most likely that these agglomerated materials are going to fall within the thoracic or inhalable size fraction, as opposed to these single fibers, which you can see will only comprise about 5% of the total sample set. Next slide, please. And to kind of just drive that point home, you know, the image on the left of this agglomerated material is much more commonly found um, than the, the single fibers that you see here on the right. Um, the image on the left, you know, most of these agglomerates might, might not look so pretty, you know, and they might not be perfectly round like this, um, but is much more common. Next slide. So the overall conclusions from the exposure assessment uh, were that elemental carbon mass exposures were relatively low with only 7% of the samples being over the NIOSH respirable or REL of one microgram per cubic meter. Um, the material typically agglomerates greater than the respirable size fraction, most likely landing within the thoracic or inhalable size fractions. Uh, there was a high percent of dermal exposures that we saw between participants, um, and this was indicative of uh, widespread contamination within most of the facilities that we visited. And then the positive sputum samples that we found um, let us know that you know internal exposures are occurring either through inhalation or ingestion. So uh, I will turn it back over to Mary. Okay, thank you so much, Matt. So to summarize again what Matt has already presented um, or discussed. The typical profile of the workers in our study, which we believe to be representative of the U.S. industry, at least at that time, were exposed to multi-wall carbon nanotubes, which are heavily used in composite manufacturing. To a lesser extent, the carbon nanotubes are used in coatings and adhesives. In particular, the, the volume that is needed in coatings is just far, far less than that used in composites. So, the quantities tended to be smaller in addition to the number of facilities using them in coatings being smaller. In our groups, they were very rarely functionalized. Among those who had single wall carbon nanotube exposure, we found that it could occur during manufacturing and sometimes occurred in conjunction with multi wall carbon nanotube exposure, um, but with low exposure potential in the electronics industry. Again, in part due to the low volume used. Um, in our workforce, we saw a cumulative duration of time exposed to these materials to be close to eight years for multi-walled carbon nanotubes on average, um, and about the same for carbon nanofibers, with less time of exposure to single wall carbon nanotubes. In terms of daily exposure, the, the mean direct exposure was 143 minutes, whereas the mean indirect exposure was almost as high as 124 minutes. And this means someone who might be working in the same area with a, a person who's directly handling carbon nanotubes, but he, he or she is not exposed themselves. So now turning to the immune response assay, we collected workers whole blood during the mid shift in the midweek. So our aim was to be able to collect the blood while the worker was being exposed to carbon nanotubes. The true culture methodology as described here the blood was placed in two pre-prepared test tubes, which were custom manufactured, as, as Aaron indicated. Um, each participant had an unstimulated null tube and a tube that was stimulated with two microbial components. One was lipopolysaccharide, LPS, and the other was staphylococcal enterotoxin type B, or SEB. And these were selected out of a number that could have been chosen because we thought that they would elicit a robust immune response. 
the uh, tubes were then incubated for an, a mean of 18 hours, and it was pretty much right on 18 hours for each participant. And the supernatants were then collected and preserved frozen until all were subsequently analyzed together after the study was finished for the cytokine and chemokine concentrations in both the stimulated and unstimulated tubes. The analysis, statistical analysis methods are shown here. The outcome variable was each worker's post-incubation ratio, ratio of the stimulant null response for each protein. Um, and we debated about whether to use the ratio or some other measure, like a, a difference. But as you'll see, there was an extremely wide range of responses across the different biomarkers, whereas the null response was not nearly as variable. And so it was just far more informative to use the ratio in, in, than any other metric. In addition, in the few studies that have been done, mostly among healthy people, using the true culture methodology, the stimulant null response ratio is the metric of choice there. We included for analysis the protein ratios that had a mean uh, ratio of greater than 1.3 or that had a coefficient of variation of greater than 30%. And the reason we selected this is that we didn't want to include non-responsive proteins in the result, since this was really looking for evidence that there is some, uh, or looking for biomarkers that show a response when stimulated with these strong uh, bacterial stimulants. We used Box-Cox transformation to improve the normality of the residuals in all of our analyses. And here on the right, we show the biomarkers that we selected. And these were selected to be a wide range of cytokines related to inflammation, um, to uh, potential endothelial response, and a number of other endpoints. Our statistical analysis further were, were then analysis of covariance, or ANCOVA. Here we grouped the uh, the TEM-based structure counts that Matt presented. We felt were the most sensitive um, exposure measure that we had in, in that it could detect very fine differences across the workers, whereas many of the, the respirable and inhalable elemental carbon measurements were below the limit of detection or were below the background level. So S structure counts was the most sensitive measure of exposure we felt. So we emphasized this for this analysis. So we divided these across the group into tertiles, into three equally spaced groups of, based on the structure count concentration. And we used ANCOVA on the untransformed metrics. We also did multiple linear regression of Box-Cox transformed protein ratios. And we adjusted the analyses for age, sex, and race which were found to be the most predictive measures on their own outside the carbon nanotube uh, variables. Next, we wanted to do a pattern analysis to determine whether there are patterns that, across the range of biomarkers that were associated with the CNTF exposure. The two pattern approaches we looked at were principal component analysis of the transformed standardized ratios. And by standardization, we reduced some of the variation in the huge responses that we saw for some uh, of these biomarkers. It's also a typical approach used in principal component analysis. We were focusing on the carbon nanotube and nanofiber exposure, but we also looked at other occupational, medical, and lifestyle exposures in particular to make sure we controlled for confounding by those variables. The second type of pattern analysis that we did was called ingenuity pathway analysis, which has been used in toxicology studies of rodents that are exposed to carbon nanotubes and nanofibers. Here are a number of results, descriptive results of, of the study group. The median age was 45. However, we had very few workers in their 40s. It was a bimodal distribution with most in their 30s and their 50s. As Matt said, this was a very, very much a research and development uh, setting for many of these companies. And you'd see a lot of younger uh, trainees or postdocs and then people more advanced in their careers. It was uh, skewed toward male sex about 20% were female, and it was prim primarily non-Hispanic white in ethnicity. However, about 18% were Asian or other races or multiple races. Most had never smoked, with only 15% being current smokers. And it was also a group that had fairly light alcohol consumption, with number of drinks per week shown here. The cumulative duration of exposure for this group is shown here. And 
also notably, the group tended to have fairly um, high reporting of current solvent exposure. So this was self-reported, but I would say Matt confirmed from industrial hygiene walkthroughs that in fact these were the solvents that people were using in their jobs. Typically alcohol, these are fairly low toxicity solvents, alcohol, acetone, toluene, and methyl ethyl ketone. Okay, the next, this slide and the next are going to take some adjustment to orient you to. This is the ENCOVA results showing the tertiles of the highest multi-day CNTF structure count concentration, which we call throughout this presentation max TEM. So Matt mentioned that there were two-day measurements taken, um, and so this is the highest of the two-day measurements. This is one of the exposure metrics. So again, we grouped the, the study group of 102 workers into tertiles from highest to lowest exposure. And we've plotted here on this spider plot the ratio for each of these biomarkers. And these ratios are ordered numerically from lowest to highest. So here you see that there are some in this area, and this is a log scale, that have ratios of two to five going across the spider plot. And then we get to the higher ratios up here, where we're at about 50, perhaps, um, up to this group, which is closer to 80, 90, or even 100 for the ratio. So the ones that had significant associations are flagged with an asterisk. And in general, we saw that the higher concentrations tended to have lower response ratios, but it wasn't significant across every biomarker. Um, but you'll notice that maybe two thirds of the biomarkers in this first graph had significant findings, and most of these showed a diminished um, biomarker response for the higher tertiles of exposure. In the second plot, these are the, the biomarkers that had very high response ratios. So here the lowest scale is a hundredfold um, increase in the stimulant tube, all the way up to several tens of thousands of ratios. Um, and here it was interesting, we saw fewer significant findings, um, maybe only a third of these very highly responsive biomarkers showed a significant effect of carbon nanotube exposure. The multiple linear regression results were fairly similar and reflected the ANCOVA results. Um, but first I can tell you that among the personal characteristics, only age, sex, race, and alcohol consumption were typically associated with these biomarker ratios. So it was a bit of a surprise to us that things like um, tobacco use were not at all related to these um, biomarkers, but there you have it. Um, there were some instances where solvent exposure was related to them, and I'll come back to that in a minute. We did see, however, very notably that the carbon nanotube nanofiber metrics were significantly inversely associated with several of the biomarkers, and I list them here. Um, I won't go through them all in great detail because we'll be exploring this a bit more with the pattern analysis next. So again, here is something that may take some orientation to get used to. What this shows is a, um, a heat map of all of the biomarker responses plotted against all of the exposure metrics that we looked at. So we've just listed them here in sort of a random order. Uh, with the interleukins tending to group together here. Um, and then the demographic variables are on the left, followed by the lifestyle and medical exposures here, other occupational exposures like solvents, polymer exposure, occupational dust exposure, and other nanomaterials are also shown here. And then lastly, the carbon nanotube metrics are shown, duration of employment and um, sputum concentrations, elemental carbon in the inhalable and respirable size fraction, and then the structure count concentrations, both in mean and maximum measurements. So the colors indicate the direction of the association with red being a positive association and green being an inverse association. And the darkness of the color indicates the significance of the response. So what's notable here is that there are very faint responses for most of these variables. You don't see a lot of either dark red or dark green. Um, another pattern that tends to stand out is that age shows a lot of significant inverse associations. And so this isn't terribly surprising because we know that as we age, we uh, become a bit more immunosuppressed. We lose some immunoresponsiveness, at least healthy people do. 
But what was interesting to us is that a similar pattern to age was seen particularly with the CNTF structure count metrics that we show here. So again, there tend to be a lot of significant inverse associations for these CNT metrics as we saw for age. This is also uh, reflected in the principal component analysis. First of all, these first several principal components are shown along um, in, this, in this chart. And the eigenvalue, which is the amount of variation in the data set that's explained by a particular principal component is shown in decreasing order. So the first principal component, which explained about 25% of the variance, was a weighted mean of both, most biomarkers. You see that these are positive coefficients and they tend to be fairly high and, and constant across the, the biomarkers. So nearly all of them were contributing to this first principal component. So you could view this as sort of a mean of all of the biomarkers. And that was the most important in expressing the variation in this data set. The second principal component was a contrast that explained about 14% of, of the data set variation. And this was a contrast between G, C, GM, CSF, um, interferon gamma, a number of interleukins, including ILP12, P70, versus a group of other interleukins, which were um, inversely associated. So this is an interesting contrast that we don't really know what it means, but there you have it. It explained 14% of the variance. Then when we regressed the results of the, um, uh, the carbon nanotubes against these principal components, we found that there was significant inverse association between both principal component one and principal component two with our structure count concentration metric. And it was most strongly associated with the maximum structure count, which is really the most sensitive metric that we had in this study. Um, in general, the, across all of the carbon nanotube exposure metrics, the beta coefficients were negative, which means that there's uh, some uh, tendency to suggest immunosuppression with these metrics. And similarly, in principal component two, there was an inverse association, which was significant for the, only for the structure count concentrations. You'll see here that we, we adjusted for the variables that were important confounders. And for principal component one, they were age, race, and alcohol consumption levels. In principal component two, the only significant variable that, that in any way affected the carbon nanotube metric was current solvent exposure, which was inversely associated with this metric as well. The second type of pattern analysis that we used um, was ingenuity pathway analysis. And here we saw strong inverse associations with age, current solvent use, and the TEM max metric, the structure count concentration, for many different annotations of diseases and biological functions. For example, stimulation of cells, shown here, um, which includes blood cells, leukocytes, and my, uh, myeloid cells, was inversely associated with age, solvent use, and the con structure count concentration. When we looked at the analytes that were only significant at the P less than 0.05, found, we found that age and current solvent use were overlapping partially with the effects that we saw with the maximum TEM structure count, but they weren't mutually overlapping. They were showing us something different. So current solvent use seemed to be rather specific in its effects, whereas the TEM max seemed to be broadly affecting many of these, as you can see. And another type of analysis with the ingenuity pathway analysis, the most significant canonical pathway of effects related to the TEM metrics, max metric, the structure count peak measurement that we found. The pathway, the role of cytokines in mediating communication between immune cells showed a general suppression of cytokine production. The green color indicates reduced levels with increasing TEM structure count concentrations and the circulating leukocytes um, following the secondary challenge. The effects appear generalized though and not related to any specific type of cell. So what did we find from all of these, this work that we did? Well, our conclusion was that the true culture assay provided a novel way to evaluate the functional immune response and how it might be associated with occupational exposures. We found here that it was more sensitive than the circulating biomarkers. In a different paper that we published, 
uh, as I mentioned, very few of the circulating markers were associated with carbon nanotube exposure, but we found quite a few that were associated with the immune response as measured by the tree culture assay. We also found that the count-based exposure metrics were uniquely related to this pattern of reduced responses in the challenged circulating blood. So again, the challenge could be viewed as any kind of microbial stimulant or um, any, any agent that one might be exposed to. In, and as we know, infectious disease is of great interest now. Both the principal component in the IPA analysis suggested that there was a generalized inhibition of all the leukocyte responses when challenged with a secondary stimulus. However, it's really important to note a major limitation, which is that this is a cross-sectional design, which hampers a causal interpretation. Um, however, it was notable that few other, or other variables were associated with these, uh, with these responses. We were quite surprised, in fact, to find that. We think that this approach could provide a relatively sensitive method to evaluate human responses to carbon nanotubes, nanofibers, or other occupational exposures that might be immunosuppressive or immunostimulatory for that matter. However, before drawing conclusions, this finding does require replication in other exposed populations. And we're encouraging our colleagues to make use of this, um, this technology when designing their own studies. I wanted to close with a comparison of what we found here, both in our um, circulating biomarker study and in the true culture results, and to then compare that to what's been found in other studies globally. So the US study that I've mentioned and that we've all been talking about is presented here first. We studied all types of carbon nanotubes and carbon nanofibers. We looked at cardiovascular endpoints, and we found a positive association only for heart rate, we also looked at pulmonary function metrics and illness and found only a positive association for respiratory allergy development, which is interesting as another type of immune response. Uh, however, other studies have not, that have looked at, at pulmonary function have not look, looked at those metrics, but <clears throat> they do agree with the US study that no effects on lung function were seen. <clears throat> the most studies have been done globally on blood biomarkers with overlapping types of, uh, of, of outcomes. And in general, we tend to see a pattern with coagulation markers being positively associated with carbon nanotube exposure and some indication that oxidative stress is inversely associated with it. Um, other biomarkers in sputum and exhaled breath um, have tended to show some inconsistent results. But really, the sensitivity increased greatly with the use of the true culture technology. Um, we're about ready to end and open it up to questions. And I'd like to thank all of the study participants, their employers, and our many colleagues at NIOSH in the, both the field and the laboratory, without whom we couldn't have conducted the study, um, as well as Rich Stratton of Myriad Rules Based Medicine, who coordinated the true culture analysis with us. And with that, I can um, hand it back over to see if there are questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Aaron, for um, this spectacular uh, work, this great study that you presented uh, very nicely to us today. I would like now to open the discussion of the paper. Um, I remind you there is this um, button that looks like an uh, like an air bubble on the right hand top side where you uh, can put your questions. That's the chat box, and um, we have already one question going into the direction of uh, exposure assessment. So I will just read: Was it possible, given the exposure assessment, to estimate the pulmonary dose? And this is the second question also: Will a significant portion of the inhaled material also be exhaled? Yeah, fascinating um, topic. Who wants to go for it? Matthew? Uh, this is Aaron. I can, I can uh, comment on that first part. In our 2013 paper, that's actually what we tried to do, is we took uh, Matt's average exposure assessment values from the facility and tried that tried to extrapolate that to a deposited dose and then convert that to our in vivo studies. So in that study, we used 
uh, I think the average at the time back in 2000, early 2000s was the inhalable was about 10.6 micrograms per meter cube. And if I recall correctly, we estimated that given estimates of, a, of an average worker breathing rate, working eight hours a day, we estimated that to be about four micrograms per day of alveolar deposition. Um, I haven't revised those numbers, but it, from the presentation today, you'll, you'll see that those averages are actually coming down. And I believe for this study, Matt's average inhalable concentration was about 40% less, just over six micrograms per meter cube. So maybe 40% of that. Um, there's a lot of assumptions that go into that calculation, and that assumes no personal protective equipment and things like that. So, assuming a normal worker ventilation rate, mats average exposures, and no protective equipment, we would assume it to just be a few micrograms per day of alveolar deposition at the working eight hours a day at the average exposure level for the inhalable. Yeah, and, and the second half of the question, given the low density, the agglomeration, and a greater fraction of it being in the inhalable size fraction, I, I, would, I wouldn't say there isn't any exhaling of the material, but I'll, I'll let Matt and Mary comment on that if they have any uh, comments. Yeah, I'm not familiar with any current research out there that, that hits that. I think it's a really good question um, and, and kind of echo what Aaron said. I mean, what we're finding in some of these agglomerates are probably more in the inhaled or thoracic size fraction. So those larger powder particles are probably going to impact in the upper airways. I wouldn't expect those to be exhaled. Um, but some of the smaller single fibers and, and you know smaller ground agglomerates less than one micron could could easily be exhaled. Um, you know, so so probably a small fraction is exhaled. Um, but I but I definitely think that's probably an area where we could probably do some more research in. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, there is another question by the same person. Looks like. Um, got into the direction of grouping. So does this uh, assessment uh, allow or give the opportunity to grouping materials based on their responses? So to discriminate between particles and fibers? That's a really great question. And we were interested in uh, obviously looking at whether carbon nanotubes behave differently from other particles. What I didn't show you in this result was that we did use the, um, the non-specific metrics that were from the direct reading instruments that Matt mentioned, which really capture, if you were to look at a typical carbon nanotube worker's exposure pro profile in terms of how many particles they receive that are carbon nanotubes compared to all of the other particles that are floating around, some of which are process derived. It's not all even air pollution. It might come from you know, melting a polymer or working with some other dusty material. Well, th those are all captured by the direct reading instrument and we have those numbers. And so we wanted to see whether there was a specific response from carbon nanotubes or whether we saw the same result looking at the direct reading instrument particle numbers or, or mass. And in fact, this finding that we presented was quite specific to carbon nanotubes or nanofibers. We didn't see the same pattern with the more general type of, of particulate plume that's read by the direct reading instruments. Now, whether you can uh, take this approach and try to discriminate among different types of carbon nanotubes, I think that would be a really interesting thing to do. Um, we would find it hard to do that, though, because it, it was so challenging just to get enough workers, to get 100 workers into the study, we had to include all different types of carbon nanotube exposure. Um, and so I think that kind of approach might be better served using an animal model, which Aaron may want to, to opine upon. Yeah, I mean, in conjunction with these studies, we took a, a wide grouping of materials that were representative of what was being handled in the U.S. facilities. Anything from 
uh, diameters as low as six nanometers, all the way up to 150 nanometers. And those also include variable lengths. Some have the same diameters with variable lengths of materials. And we are, in fact, within that grouping of materials, uh, not necessarily between other particles as of yet, but within the broad class of carbon nanotubes and nanofibers, we have a pretty well controlled in vivo study that is looking to group the broad class into different toxicological aspects. So some may translocate better than others, some may cause more histopathology, some may cause more inflammation, we're also looking at genotoxicity. Those studies have actually concluded. Um, the first paper is in clearance on our end right now, and the other two are being finished up. So yes, we are doing exactly that with a grouping within this single class with sort of the anticipation of a broader look of expanding that to other materials in the future. There was also something, um, question on um, interactions with other respirable uh, agents. So is there an indication that this induced or also reduced immune effects that responses that you showed um, would then increase or uh, decrease adverse effects to some other respirable agents? Maybe you can, can comment on this a little bit. Yeah, that's a really good question too. I, I'll I'll try myself and then see what Aaron has to say. I, I think it would have been really fascinating to try to look at the interaction between its solvent exposure and carbon nanotube exposure, but we just didn't have enough um, of high, a large enough sample size to be able to do that. I think it would be an interesting follow-on. Um, the other thing to consider is, you know, what is what are we measuring? It's immune response, and so what are the clinical implications of this if this is really true? Are we finding that workers become who are highly exposed to carbon nanotubes show signs of immunosuppression? Are they getting sick um, or catching viruses or um, bacterial infections more quickly than others? So that this is a, a key question in interpreting the findings of this, of this type of study. Um, so yes, there, there are implications of immunosuppression for many different types of health endpoints and the question of whether they could make you more susceptible to other agents as well that are co-occurring in the workplace is, is a really key question. But Aaron, what, what would you say about this or Matt? Uh, I, I would say that the example of welding fume would suggest a yes. What got us interested originally in using that true culture system is the macrophage population seems to be immunosuppressed following a welding fume exposure in the lung. And there's also recommendations that welders should be immunized against uh, forms of pneumonia because they are susceptible to a secondary infection. So there, there is evidence in other occupational exposures that the particulate, if it is immunosuppressive locally, will then make you more susceptible to a secondary infection. And those were well complemented with in vivo studies that gave welding fume exposure and then gave a listeria challenge afterwards. And they were the, the in vivo studies showed that the welding fume exposure really slowed down the ability of the animals to respond to this secondary challenge. So that's kind of what got us into the true culture analysis originally is we, we were getting into looking at the systemic effects following a pulmonary exposure. And we started to think, hey, th this could be more broadly expansive and these cells in the periphery could be immunocompromised even before they ever got to the lung. So there is evidence in the literature, if you piece it all together, that would suggest, yes, that you could be more susceptible to a secondary infection. Yeah, way somehow following up this line, there is a question. Um, given that you found a positive association between the self-reported respiratory allergies and the CNTF exposure metrics, this immunosuppressive effect 
uh, was based on biomarkers analysis. Have you, do you have any insight on whether it could be due to the composite rather than to the CNTF, carbon-based material, and what biological ground could be behind this finding? That's a really good question as well. Um, about the composite, I don't really think, I think the evidence is suggesting that's not the case because we did ask in our questionnaire about current exposure to polymers as part of this, um, as part of our suite of, of questions. And, and it was a common exposure, but not everyone had it. However, we didn't see really any positive or inverse association of that exposure metric with self-reported exposure to polymers. So I think if that were what was driving it, we would have really seen that appearing in the in the self-reported exposure to polymers. Um, whether the, the biological ground behind both immunosuppression and immunostimulation is really fascinating. And I, I, I'd love to know what Aaron thinks about that, if, if that's something that you see as well in the welding studies, because it, do, it is a puzzle that there's some sort of, if there is an immune response that happening is happening, is it immunostimulatory and immunosuppressive? Um, and some of the circulating biomarker findings do suggest that there are positive associations with some of, of these immune um, cytokines as well. So I, I'm not sure. I don't. I'm not an immunologist, but I would love to to hear what others think. I would also say that the research on the true culture assay measuring healthy immune response is really really challenging. And so if you're interested in this method, I suggest that you take a look at the, the few papers that are out there on using true culture in a healthy population um, and in, in other populations, because interpreting the findings can be a bit challenging. But we, we were encouraged to see that the characteristics in terms of demographics that we're tracking with true culture were the same in our study as, as were found in those earlier studies. So I don't know, Erin, do you have any thoughts on this dual nature of immunosuppression and immunostimulation? Um, not more than what you added, but there, you know, it can go both ways. Like I talked about welding fume being immunosuppressive, but when you do that same in vivo challenge with listeria, but following a silica exposure, it actually clears it much faster because the oxidative burst induced by the silica exposure actually kills the pathogen. So you're, you're better off in certain instances, but yeah, it, it's it's complex when you're when you're talking about going both ways with the immune system. And yes, I'm not a trained immunologist as well, so I would defer to people a lot smarter than me. Yeah, I mean, definitely the immune system is quite a uh, multifaceted uh, system, and of course, there are many more responses possible than just going either direction. Um, this is a typical example for that, definitely. You mentioned true culture, actually, um, Mary. So is it um, expected to have a, a commercial version of that, or is it anyway easy to, to, to just learn how to do it as a research lab? Huh, you know, that's, that's a great question for Aaron. I would say as a, the field person who was watching everyone do it, it, it was far easier to implement in the field than I expected. It, it was rather demanding in, in terms of the, the specimen handling and the uh, the tubes were, you know, you had to definitely didn't want them thawing and freezing. And um, but the methodology was fa fairly robust. Uh, we were quite surprised to see that we got responses on nearly every tube. Is that right, Aaron? Am I remembering that correctly? It was. Yeah, we had a hundred percent success rate in the stimulation. And yeah. I mean, I, I think you can just they have a white paper on it. And then we worked closely with the company, but then we were also put in touch with uh, the individual in Germany that actually manufactures the tubes so that we could work with the lots of stimulants because it took, Mary, you can correct me, but I think it took almost two years to collect all these samples because of the going to 12 different facilities and things like that. So we really had to upfront take the time to uh, design the study so that we could actually get something interpretable at the end. So with that being the case, we 
I, I think we had a really robust, reproducible response that we were actually able to do over a couple years using this. And yes, it's all it's all commercially available. Oh, yeah. Was there actually a reason why the single walled carbon nanotubes did um, show much lower overall exposures by the workers than the multiple walled ones? And was this just kind of a coincidence? No, I don't think it's a coincidence, and I'm sure Matt will would love to explain the reason. Yeah, yeah. The difference was, you know, single wall carbon nanotubes are predominantly used in electronics, and they're used in very low quantities, and they're typically used in either a liquid or, a, you know, a semi semi liquid, you know, aqueous solution. Um, so just, you know, just being used in that nature reduces its exposure potential. You know, compared to the composite companies that were predominantly handling, handling multi-wall carbon nanotubes, you know, and the initial starting point for them is typically a powder. Um, so they would mix it with a resin and typically melt it down. Um, so that in, that initial exposure from the multi-wall is typically coming from the, the powder form of the material, whereas, you know, these electronics companies that were handled in the single walls never really handled the material in a powder form. Did you actually look at the stiffness of the of the tubes in some of your essays aspect ratio stiffness and things like that we didn't have that as a metric i i would say very few of the images that we saw suggested that there were stiff carbon nanotubes but matt correct me if i'm wrong yeah and uh, i'll let aaron back me up on this too from some of his recent studies you know he did pretty extensive uh, characteriz characterization of the materials but um, as a typically as the diameter increases, you see a little bit more rigidity in the tubes. So, you know, for carbon nanofibers, they're typically a little bit more rigid and in some of the wider diameter multi-wall carbon nanotubes, as opposed to the, you know, smaller diameter multi-walls and single walls. Um, so you'll, you'll typically see a lot more agglomeration in those smaller materials as opposed to those larger diameter materials. Aaron, do you, do you con concur with that? Do you feel the same? Yeah, we, we were looking into actually having the uh, stiffness specifically measured, um, but we were unable to get that. But yeah, I, I think the di increasing diameter, and then if you adjust that for changing length, uh, I think that's what our studies will show will be a, a, an adequate parameter to make those conclusions. Oh yeah, thanks a lot. Do we have any questions from the audience? Um, you want to use the chat uh, function to quickly still put your question? Uh, there is one. Uh, in Australia, uh, the glass have uh, also found some positive association on immune system, but without identifying the nature of an, uh, engineered nanomaterials. In your study, it seems that other uh, engineered nanomaterials not Carbon nanotubes have also some positive effect, complex, but really so. It, it, it actually, yeah, it adds to actually our discussion of before. Um, thanks a lot um, uh, on the complexity of the immune um, activations uh, observed for this reason. Any further comments? Um, we are recording this session. The recording is going to be shared by the NIA uh, YouTube channel. Um, I would like to thank the three presenters uh, for their uh, exceptional talk and uh, the oh, Martin, may I, just, um, may I just pop in because I think some of the questions haven't shown up to you. Um, I'm receiving them as an organizer, but not necessarily can be um, viewed by everybody. So I I'm going to, could I just read out a few of the additional questions that I can see that I think perhaps you cannot? Please. Sorry about that. I just realized that you weren't, you weren't seeing them all. So we've got a question. I'll start from the top. It says, how long are you following up the participants for determining resulting chronic effects? Okay, that's a, a great question. That's a future phase of the study. And Matt, I believe, has the most information about that. Yeah, so so right now uh, we're not necessarily following up all these individual participants, although they will they're they're the starting point for a larger cohort study that we are currently con 
collecting right now. Um, we have over 600 uh, workers in the U.S. that have agreed to participate, or as far as the companies go, have provided uh, work history records. Now, we don't have necessarily individual exposure records for each person because, you know, most companies simply aren't sampling and can provide us that information. Um, but we at least have their work history and we know how long they've handled the material and how long they've worked at each company. Okay, and I have another one, which is what about the possibility of using metal contaminants on the CNTs as an exposure metric? Matt, that's for you. <laughs> I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Is it using metal contaminants? What about uh, the possibility of using metal contaminants on the CNTs as an exposure metric? Yeah, and, and that's certainly a possibility. Um, the difficulty that we have is, you know, since we were going into 12 different facilities, you know, theoretically using, you know, more than 12 different types of nanomaterials, or not necessarily nanomaterials, but different types of carbon nanotubes, um, they would have different types of catalysts used. Now, it, it was a coincidence that most of them were iron-based catalysts, but they also had some different types of metals. Molybdenum was one, uh, cobalt. Um, so, I, I think for simpli simplification for us, it was just more, um, it was just, you know, across the board, easier to use elemental carbon rather than having to track down what type of metal catalyst each company was using to, to perform that analysis. Um, and, you know, by doing that, it provided us more consistent results across the board as, as, you know, by doing it individually. Okay, and I have another one. Um, for the elemental carbon analysis, were the personal exposure samples corrected with blank stroke background samples? Yes, every sample was uh, background corrected. So, and that varied by facility. You know, some some companies, um, you know, we, we, we varied from, I would say, um, you know, clean air type facilities using HEPA filtration systems to, you know, buildings that didn't have any HVAC systems that were essentially, you know, had the back door open. Um, so we, we, we tried to collect background samples, which were we felt most representative. Um, and each, each, personal sample was background corrected from a sample, a background corrected sample from that was collected on that individual day. So yes, they were corrected. Okay, then we have, is the heat map obtained by PCA already published in a journal paper or open documents? And this was the heat map for a cytokines and uh, chemokines versus exposures to solvents, carbon nanotubes, et cetera. The heat map image is published, yes, with the manuscript. Great, so that's fine, they'll get that. Uh, we're getting through them now. We have, it is interesting that past years of exposure did not show up as a relevant cofactor, suggesting that these responses were an acute effect and that there was not a compensatory response over time in modulating the inhibition of the immune response. Can you comment? Hmm. Well, yeah. So duration of exposure, um, most people had fairly short-term exposure. I would say that the number of workers with long-term exposure was, was fairly minimal. We did interestingly see an association of allergy, respiratory allergy with duration of exposure. So that immunostimulatory re reaction that we've already discussed was definitely related to duration. In general, though, you're right, we didn't see a strong association with, um, with the true culture responsiveness. So whether this means that it's a bit of a transient effect or a short-term effect, it would be interesting. It would also be interesting if we had a larger study size to look at interactions between exposure concentrations and duration of, of um, time worked with the material to see if the, the dose response differed by how long you had been spending work, working with these materials. And I think that kind of analysis would be necessary to really draw any conclusions. Okay. Uh, and then we have another comment that says, if a CNT type behaves quite differently compared to other CNT types, because no respirable fraction can be produced. Um, so in an in so an in vivo study is not possible to execute or perform. How can the toxicity by inhalation show a result if this would have a negative result or not for human health? Does, do you understand that question? It's related to how industry can determine what precautions are necessary. Yeah, I, I would I, say... I can, uh, oh, yeah. Go ahead, Aaron, I'll, I'll chime in after you. 
Well, I was going to touch on the in vivo part where we are working with a material that has a very limited respirable fraction, uh, both in the field. Uh, it's a, it's a cross-linked multi-walled carbon nanotube, and it has mainly an inhalable deposition, and we're seeing some pathology in the upper airways that we hadn't seen typically with ones that form sort of 500 nanometer agglomerates or singlets and can get more easily into uh, the deep airways, where like with the traditional Mitsui 7, that small percentage that was left in the upper airways was cleared after a week. These larger cross-linked ones get sort of trapped in the conducting airways and they're not as easily removed and pathology is developing. That's why Matt was sort of alluding to the idea that there's an exposure limit for the respirable fraction, but should there be considerations for the inhalable fraction? And I'll turn it back over to you, Mary. Thank you, Erin. That dovetails with what I was going to say, which is in our study of circulating biomarkers, we actually found that the inhalable fraction of elemental carbon was more strongly correlated with those outcomes than the respirable fraction. I'm not convinced that that's biologically um, this indicative. What it may be more indicative of is that the inhalable allowed us better discrimination of differences in exposures across the workforce because of the problem that I mentioned earlier with um, the background correction leading to, in some instances, sort of negative uh, respirable exposure concentrations. That problem was worse for the respirable fraction than it was for the inhalable. So I, I would say the jury is still out, certainly on whether the inhalable fraction is, is safe, quote unquote, um, or safer than the respir respirable size fraction. Okay, that's the end of the questions. So I'll hand back to Martin. Thank you, Claire. I indeed did not see these questions. Um, I did not get any further questions meanwhile. So I would be tempted did to ask. I'm, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, or is this one that you've already read, Claire? I don't know what you're talking about. We have, sorry, I, I'm reading it. I see that it's a, a question to a presenter, but I think that you have already read this question. So my apologies. Okay. Well, I was just going to ask my final question. Is there, was there any kind of uh, variation in pro personal protective wear in the study cohort or is this standardized? Oh, it was yeah. very variable. Matt would love to tell you all about that, I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, a lot of these companies, I mean, it varied from very well known, you know, had their own health and safety teams, had a very good health and safety plan and were very developed in their respiratory protection. Um, and then we also had companies that were very small and were very unfamiliar with respiratory protection standards. Um, so it did vary from from company to company quite a bit. Um, uh, we actually kind of address that and we can include um, in one of the papers that I published, we can include with the list um, that, that talks about the different types of respiratory protection used at, the, at some of the different companies. So, mm -hmm. Fascinating. Um, well, thanks a lot to all of you for your presentations, for these extensive discussions, your answers. I thank the audience for their uh, very interesting questions. Um, this was a very um, vigorous uh, we webinar and we are hoping and uh, hopefully enjoying in future more of such kind of webinars. Please stay tuned to the nano safety cluster. Uh, eventually sign up if you like to the mailing list of work group A which uh, who is going to organize such kind of uh, events. Um, I thank a lot uh, for the team of uh, the team of the NIA the nanotechnology industry association for promotion and for kind of um, yeah putting this together. Thank you, everybody. Have a nice afternoon. Have a nice day in US. Um, thank you for your contributions um, and uh, good luck. <laughs>